So the board gets quite a few questions, I want to say almost weekly, about medical assistance and what they can and cannot do. We get questions from medical assistants themselves, uh, concerned that maybe they're being asked to do something that they think is beyond their scope, and also from physicians trying to make sure that they're making appropriate requests. So it, it seemed timely to review the laws and regulations relating to medical assistance. So and we we'll, also got a request from one of the board members to put this that's, on there. That's correct. So the medical assistance are set forth in statute because a lot of the things that they do would be considered the practice of medicine requiring a license if an exception was not carved out for them. And so the, the statute carves out the exception, authorizes medical assistance who are unlicensed individuals to perform certain tasks, and then the regulations make the statute more specific and uh, puts forth a list of some examples of things that they can do and also provides more details about the training that is required. So, you know, the definition of a medical assistant is set forth in statute. It's important to remember that they are unlicensed. They don't go through the uh, background and, and verification checks that licensed individuals go through. They have to be at least 18 years old. They have to have appropriate training, which we'll go through in more detail in a minute. They have to have specific authorization for each task that they perform. And they have to perform only appropriate tasks. These are non-invasive and, you know, I think needles are invasive, so it's, uh, I guess, a, a matter of perspective, but uh, non-invasive routine technical support services. Routine technical support services, these are things that each office is a little bit different and practice area is a little bit different. And so something that a medical assistant could do for a, a dermatologist, uh, if you have an unusual patient coming in to a dermatologist and the task that the medical assistant is being asked to perform is not typical for the dermatologist's office, uh, that's not appropriate for the medical assistant to do. It needs to be something regularly performed in that office. And they have to have a supervisor. And a supervisor can be a physician and surgeon, a podiatrist, a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, or a certified nurse midwife. So a specific authorization. It's a written order. It's prepared by the supervisor. It authorizes the procedures that the medical assistant can perform on the patient. This is placed in the patient's medical record. The other alternative is that there's a standing order where you have confidence in this medical assistant to perform uh, flu shots. And so, for uh, patients that haven't had one and need one and uh, there's not a contraindication for it, that's all been verified previously by an appropriate licensee, then you can say this person, when they come in for their yearly checkup, the medical assistant can give them the flu shot. That is noted in the patient's record. So I mentioned that medical assistants do have to have appropriate training, and there's two pathways for training. There's on-the-job training, so no particular formal training is required, uh, no degree is required for that pathway. 
The second pathway is formal education, which we'll get to in a minute. But for on-the-job training, this can be performed by a physician and surgeon, a podiatrist, or a nurse practitioner, PA, RN, LVN, or what's called a qualified medical assistant. All of those individuals are acting under the direction of a physician and surgeon or podiatrist. There is special training required for administering medication by inhalation. So a physician and surgeon or a respiratory care provider has to do that type of training. It cannot be delegated to another type of licensee. <clears throat> so all of this training must be documented. You have to describe the content of the training, the duration of the training, uh, and the fact that this medical assistant has been deemed competent to perform the task that they've been trained on. The physician and surgeon or other approved instructor must sign and date the certificate. So when you do that, you're putting your stamp of approval that this person has been appropriately trained and can do these tasks. And that's significant. You don't want to take it lightly. You want to have the right medical assistant performing the right task. And you know, not everyone is good at drawing blood. I just want to say that. <laughs> So a qualified medical assistant, you, you heard me use that term when I was talking about training. A qualified medical assistant can train another medical assistant, but that doesn't just mean that the person knows how to do something and they can teach someone else. This is a particular <coughs> term of art. It means that the medical assistant has been certified by a certifying agency approved by the medical board. And they have to meet certain requirements for formal education, years of experience, taking tests, uh, agreeing to take continuing <coughs> education in order for them to be certified and recertified. So, you know, this, this is not the person who has had on-the-job training and has not taken any further steps to uh, get recognized as meeting these qualifications. This is a person who has gone through a formal process of getting certified. That person can then instruct other medical assistants with the physician's uh, approval. So the other pathway is training through formal education. Now, a medical assistant can go through this formal education but still not be certified. So uh, that is still an additional step that they must take. There's a lot of programs out there for medical assistants. Uh, it is important that the individual going through these programs makes sure that the program meets the qualifications under the regulation to ensure that they'll be able to get a job based on this training path. So some overriding principles. Medical assistants cannot diagnose. They cannot uh, treat or make decisions about what an appropriate test is, what the next steps are. Uh, they can't do any task that is deemed invasive. Uh, and you know there are situations that where they're put in a, a position where they're asked to assess 
something. That is not permissible. So assessing the result of a skin test, for example, they can't do that. They can document what it looks like, but ultimately the proper licensee needs to be the one who makes that assessment and informs the patient. You can't use a medical assistant to perform a task that where a license is required to do the task. If that's done, then the medical assistant is practicing medicine without a license, which is a crime. And the uh, physician is violating the Medical Practice Act by aiding and abetting the unlicensed practice of medicine. So it, it, it's just important to remember their, their role and also the process that they go through to get that position. It, it's very minimum requirements and so you need to keep that in mind when you're giving them an assignment to do. It needs to be appropriate for their level of training and uh, experience and recognizing that they are not licensed. With that in mind, there's a remarkable number of tasks that they are permitted to perform. And medical assistants can make or break the patient's experience in an office and they're, they're invaluable. So <coughs> they can administer medications in a variety of different ways. If they are going to give injections or draw blood through venipuncture or skin prick, they must have additional hours of training. That is set forth in detail in regulation. But it's 10 clock hours of training in each of those areas that you're going to ask them to perform. And they have to demonstrate 10 uh, satisfactory performances of each type of injecture, injection, uh, venipuncture, and skin puncture. In addition to those uh, categories of training, if you're going to have them do this, they have to have training in pertinent anatomy and physiology, choice of equipment, proper sterile technique, hazards and complications, patient care following the treatment or the test, emergency procedures, and this is important, California law and regulations for medical assistance. I think it, it's it's a good review for both parties, and they should feel comfortable if they think they're being asked to do something outside of what the law and regulations allow, that they can speak up and get clarification. And so it's a good reminder for everyone involved in their training and the practice to review those. So. On all of these tasks that they are permitted to do, they have to be authorized to do it after they've been trained and that training's documented. It's also important to remember that the supervisor has to be there. If, if it's not the physician there, it has to be someone the physician has authorized to be present when these tasks are being performed. So, there's a number of things listed. I'm just going to do some highlights. Um, the typical things, getting vital signs. You know, they, they can they do that uh, routinely and document it. Again, they can measure and describe skin test reaction they can't decide what that means and then tell the patient, oh, you don't have TB or you do. Uh, it has to be documented but referred to a proper licensee to make the determination. Uh, they can perform non-invasive tests, <coughs> electrocardiogram, <coughs> plethysmography. 
there are some things that are listed in the regulation specifically, and then sometimes we get questions about can they do something that's not listed, and the process that we go through is to look to see how similar it is to what they're already permitted to do. And if it's non-invasive and the training is straightforward <laughs> and there's not a, a risk to the patient, then it can fall in line and be something that medical assistants are, are permitted to do. They can remove sutures and staples as long as it's not a, a very serious injury. Applying and removing bandages, um, cleaning the ears, hearing tests. Uh, they can collect a variety of different bodily fluids, swabbing the throat, and of course assisting patients with walking and transferring. get quite a few questions about whether medical assistants can provide patients with information, uh, you know, next steps types of things, and they can with specific authorization to do so. When they know what to say and they've been told that it's okay to convey that information to the patient, yes, they can do that. Uh, these tests, all of them, it has to be something routinely done in that office like I mentioned earlier. It can't be something that is rare and you're asking the medical assistant to perform it and they haven't done it in two or three years. It, it, it needs to be something that's very routine. Cut the nails of an otherwise healthy patient. So you wouldn't have the medical assistant cutting the nails of someone who is having problems with their feet due to diabetes. So some of this is, is you know, common sense not putting patients at additional risk. Medical assistants cannot administer anesthesia. So this is a question that comes up the law specifically says they are not authorized to do that. And again, if they're going to administer medication by inhalation, that requires special training from a physician and surgeon or a respiratory care therapist. A PA and NP cannot perform that training unless they have that respiratory care therapist license. <coughs> There are provisions under optometry where it, it does not expand who a, a supervisor can be. So that's why on these dealing with the eye tests and, and uh, procedures that medical assistants can perform, it says specifically in there, physician or optometrist. So I've, I've kept those in. So they, they can put in some uh, drops and perform some tests, but they, they can't do the, um, oh, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, just some additional non-invasive procedures that they can perform. And then there's uh, things that they can't do. They can't do the subjective refraction of a person's eye. That can't be delegated to a medical assistant. Inserting or removing urine catheters, that's been deemed invasive, and medical assistants don't do that. They don't insert IVs, and they don't uh, inject medication into IV lines. No performing telephone triage. They don't have the proper training and license to do that. This comes up a lot with injection of collagen, Botox, use of lasers. 
in uh, these medical spas. <coughs> medical assistants cannot do those things. And again, they can't do anything that requires assessment or interpretation. So debridement, cauterizing wounds, uh, and, and again, administering anesthetic of any kind is beyond their scope. They can't mix medications, compounding. Um, a, a proper supervisor has to verify what the dose and medication is that's being given to a patient, and this makes that difficult, so they can't do it. There's a lot of information about medical assistance and what they're able to perform on our website. There's a list of frequently asked questions, and of course the laws and regulations applicable to medical assistance are, are all right there and handy. So happy to answer any questions.